Hello and thanks for joining me today. My name is Dr. Aboro. I am a family nurse practitioner with Clinical Trials of Texas and an investigator as well. And today we'll be talking about COVID-19 and racial and ethnic minority groups. So first, just a quick overview of the coronavirus disease. Um, it's a novel virus and a disease that was recently um, discovered and it affects people now. And so the CDC has put out guidelines to diagnose this disease. Uh, so first, it's a symptomatic disease that's based on the following criteria with virologic confirmation, meaning that there's evidence of the virus in this person. They have to have at least two of the following symptoms, either fever, chills, rigors, myalgia, which is mu muscle aches, headaches, a sore throat, a new loss of uh, sense of taste or smell, and at least one of the, of the following symptoms, cough, shortness of breath, difficulty breathing, uh, or severe respiratory illness with at least one of the following. So clinical or radiological evidence of pneumonia, meaning there's evidence and imaging of damage to the lungs or acute respiratory distress syndrome. At this time, as of July the 8th, 2020, there's no prevention for this virus and there is no treatment for the disease. Uh, we do know that about 80% of the cases are mild to moderate, 15% uh, of the infections go on to be severe, and about 5% go on to be critical. Now, mild to moderate might be a little misleading, right? So you think it's not, harm it's not harmful, uh, but for some of these folks who have mild to moderate illness, they have symptoms that persist weeks after the virus is now negative in their, in their system. So, you know, mild to moderate illness doesn't imply no symptoms. It just means that it's not as severe as those hospitalized with the disease. So who is at risk? You know, when this virus first uh, was discovered, they thought it was affecting primarily older adults uh, or certain groups of people. But as of today, we know that everyone is at risk. Um, but while everyone is at risk of getting COVID-19, some people may be more likely to get COVID-19 or experience severe illness. History shows us that severe illness and death rates tend to be higher for racial and ethnic minority populations, especially during public health emergencies like we currently do have with the COVID-19 pandemic. So this uh, slide shows you some charts uh, for Burr County. Uh, we've got cases, hospitalizations, and deaths. Burr County uh, involves San Antonio. And we see that about 80% of all the cases, hospitalizations, and the deaths um, occur in people of color or ethnic and racial minorities. Okay, and that is defined as people who are non-Hispanic whites. Okay, so other people other than that. And so you see a huge population with uh, Hispanic Latinos, both for the cases, hospitalizations, and deaths. Now we're in San Antonio, Texas, so we do have a huge population of Hispanics here as well. But you can see that the, the cases, hospitalizations, and deaths skewed towards racial and ethnic minorities. Racial and ethnic minorities are also disproportionately increased, are disproportionately increased risk of getting the COVID-19 and experiencing severe illness, regardless of their age. And the question is why? Well, we have long-standing systemic health and social inequities for racial and ethnic minority groups. I mean, you see the highest rates among American Indians and Alaskan Natives, Black persons and Hispanics, and the next chart shows you that. So this chart shows you the age-adjusted COVID-19 associated hospitalization rates by race and ethnicity. And what you see here is the rate in American Indians and Alaskan Natives is almost five times the rate for non-Hispanic whites. You have about the same gap here for blacks compared to the non-Hispanic whites. And the rate is almost four times the rate for Hispanics as it is in non-Hispanic whites. So there's huge differences here. Why do we care? Why do healthcare disparities matter? Well, for one, our population is increasingly becoming more diverse. I mean, currently, as of 2016, about 40% of Americans belong to a racial or ethnic minority, and 61% are non-Hispanic whites. By 2050, the projection is very different. We're projecting over 50% of the population being people of color, and only 48% being non-Hispanic white. And so it's important that we pay attention to healthcare disparities because our population is changing 
and we're going to need to care for the population, all of us, right, both the Hispanics and the Asians and the Blacks as well as the Whites. And so it's important that we pay attention to our healthcare system and the disparities that exist and begin to address them. Where we live and learn and work and play affect our health. You know, over time, inequities and in social determinants of health lead to different levels of health risks, needs, and they ultimately impact the outcomes among racial and ethnic minorities. So these places, the places where we live and learn and work and play, these are referred to as our social determinants of health. In public health emergencies, such as the COVID-19 pandemic, these conditions can isolate people from the resources that they need to both prepare for and respond to outbreaks. Now, in the United States, healthcare is not cheap. It is expensive and the costs keep rising every day. Some social determinants of health as well. So for racial and ethnic minorities, they're more likely to live in densely populated areas or rely on public transportation. I mean, how do you socially distance when you're in a living condition that doesn't allow you to, or when you have to ride the public transportation with, with loads of people? It, it becomes hard, even if you wanted to. You know, a lot of racial and ethnic minorities also live farther from grocery stores. I mean, we have things like medical deserts and food deserts, uh, places that are underserved medically, where it's harder to access healthcare facilities, access good healthcare providers. It makes it harder for people to stock up on supplies if they're far from grocery stores. It makes it harder for them to stay home because they have to make frequent trips uh, to the stores to get what they need. It also makes it harder for them to receive care when they're sick because there's no access to healthcare facilities that are needed. Now, even though our population is projected to grow and expand to, you know, over 50% people of color by 2050, most of those that are uninsured are, are minorities. So non-Hispanic whites have a rate that's almost three times the rate of, um, sorry, Hispanics have a rate of almost three times the rate of non-Hispanics whites for un uninsurance, and blacks have a rate that's almost twice that of non-Hispanic whites. Um, and so you see that the people that need healthcare the most are those less likely to have access to it because they don't have insurance. Income and poverty also play a huge role in getting access both to healthy foods, to health care, which is not cheap and not free, and safe neighborhoods. Um, and this next chart really buttresses that point. Um, and so on this chart, you can see that white men earn on average significantly more than black men and Hispanic men. And they earn more than all women regardless of their race. And while this might not look significant, over time, you see the gap just widening in the wealth. So that by 2016, the average white family has almost seven times uh, greater the wealth of a black family or a Hispanic family. And this huge disparity has really helped to potentiate the disparities in healthcare that we see because you need insurance and it costs money. You need access to healthcare and it costs money. You need a good neighborhood to live in with access to amenities and that costs money. Uh, access to healthy foods and grocery stores and that costs money. And so this income gaps also help to uh, contribute to the disparities in healthcare that we see. Another contributing factor is help-seeking behaviors, and this refers to the likelihood that someone will actually seek help when they need it. And racial and ethnic minorities may be more likely than whites to avoid or delay care, and there's a slew of reasons why this might happen. You know, but some of the reasons are displayed right here. Um, and so in adults who did not receive care or delayed care in 2018, we see a higher percentage of those in racial and ethnic minorities who were not able to receive care because of the cost. It was too expensive for them compared to their white counterparts. Uh, and people delay care for other reasons as well, but you see higher percentages in minorities and people of color than you see in white folks. And so some of the reasons include trust or mistrust of the healthcare system, bias on the part of the patient or the part of the healthcare provider, access to health care, whether or not it's you know available in their area, how long they have to travel to access the health care resources that they need. But for a variety of reasons, minorities, racial, racial and ethnic minorities uh, have to hoop over multiple barriers to access the health care that they need. So looking ahead, how do we begin to bridge the gap for health equity? 
uh, a little disclaimer here, this definitely doesn't address all of the possible ways that we could do that, but it does touch on a few things that I can do and that you can do to help start making this process uh, better to get the conversation going and get us going on the right path. One of the first things that we can do is communicate. You know, we need to communicate about COVID-19. We need to talk about its impact on racial and ethnic minorities and um, talk about it in a way that's transparent, in a way that's credible, in a way that's kind, in a way that's that's uh, transparent. You know, a part of communicating is listening and people have been encouraged to speak up. People have been encouraged to have conversations about health disparities in our healthcare system. Um, but it only makes a difference if people are listening. And so, you know, a good part of listening is active listening, listening to maybe just to hear, perhaps to understand, um, you know, and not necessarily to count a bag or to argue or to make a point, but just listening to hear what the other person is trying to say. Another important part of communicating is being aware of social, cultural, and the health needs of specific communities. You know, friends, one of the things that make us so unique is that we're slightly different in our own unique ways. And so seeing things from other people's perspective, being able to put someone, yourself in someone else's shoes or to see where they're coming from, to understand their own needs in their own way and see how we may be able to navigate to meet them where they are is also really, really important. The next thing we can all do is inform. If you've got information that can help somebody else, information about where to get tested for COVID-19, how to seek care for COVID-19, how to connect people to free or low-cost healthcare services, let's share that information. Let's share that information, be a good neighbor, be a good friend, share the information you have. You know, and if you uh, have friends or family or persons who are around you who may not be following the guidelines, encourage them to do the same. Share the information you have with them. You're just as safe as the person next to you. So if you're doing your bit in terms of wearing a mask, washing your hands, socially distancing, uh, but the person next to you is not doing the same, it puts you at risk as well. So making sure that not just you are following the guidelines, but that everybody around you is doing the same helps to make us all safer. So this slide just shows you some resources available in our community right here in San Antonio. And these resources provide care for people who either have no public insurance or private insurance or have a job but can't afford insurance. So you need care that's provided where the pricing is on a sliding scale, takes into consideration how much you make and how much you're able to contribute to your health care. And some of these are completely free. So we have phone numbers listed here, email addresses listed here give them a call. So CareLink is a resource that's available right here in San Antonio. Central Med has clin clinics that are spread throughout the city that you can access. There's a mental health support line that's completely free and they can also link you to further mental health care services. If you have trouble paying utility bills or um, they need assistance, there is a line there to help you. And then COVID-19 testing is currently ongoing in San Antonio. Multiple locations are testing free of charge. You do have to have some symptoms to be tested. Only one of the locations currently listed here require an appointment for drive through testing. Uh, but these are options available to people right here in the local community. I bet if you're not in San Antonio, there are also resources available in your community. Feel free to ask around, Google if you have to but access resources that are available, especially for racial and ethnic minorities who don't have insurance or who don't have the resources to access the care that they need. This can be very valuable, especially in times like these. Finally, one of the things that we can all do is participate. Participate in community initiatives to reduce health disparities. Lots of cities and communities are introducing evidence-based strategies to help bridge the gap. Um, and so if you can be a part of that, it's a step in the right direction. Another way you can be a part of the solution is to participate in clinical trials. Not sure what that is? Clinical trials are research studies that are done in people to help make sure that drugs are safe and that they work uh, for everyone. And for clinical trials, representation matters. You know, about 40% of Americans currently identify uh, as a part of racial or ethnic minority. Um, and yet, 
the participation in clinical trials skew heavily white. Sometimes almost 80 to 90 percent of participants in clinical trials are white. Yet, when the medication makes it on the market, uh, both whites and non-whites get to use the medications. How do we know it works for all? You know, a lot of diseases present with different symptoms in different ethnic groups. Uh, sometimes outcomes are different, and even sometimes the side effects experienced vary. But there's no way to know that this is going to work for all of us if there's no representation in the studies that lead to putting the medications on the market. So encouraging you to participate, look for opportunities in your local community. Right here in San Antonio, we have multiple COVID-19 studies going on. At Clinical Trials of Texas, there are multiple vaccine studies, diagnostic studies going on. And here's the good news. You don't have to be sick to participate. Actually, we're looking for healthy volunteers, uh, people who are healthy and want to be a part of finding a way to prevent this virus can participate in a study. If you have questions, feel free to ask. And I actually encourage you to ask questions. If need be, ask to make, meet the doctor, to meet the care team. Make sure you're going to a place that's licensed, a place that's got board certified providers on board. Um, and make sure you have all your questions answered before you participate. For most clinical tr uh, trials, there is something called an informed consent form. It tells you about the study, tells you what to expect, tells you what will be going on. And here's the good news. Complete, uh, participation is always completely and always voluntary, meaning you can choose to be a part of it and at some point decide, you know what, I want to do this, but I changed my mind. That's always okay. So participation is voluntary. You do not have to be sick to participate. Our information is listed on the screen if you'd like to find out more. If you have questions, feel free to give us a call right after this presentation, or you're welcome to type in your questions as well while the presentation is going on. The key here is be a part of the solution. Communicate, listen, inform people of the information that you have. If you have a resource that's going to help somebody else, feel free to share it and participate in things that's going to help get us moving in the right direction. Thank you for listening today. Here are some references that were used to present this information to you. And now we'll open it up for questions and discussions. So there are no questions or discussions. You're welcome to give us a call after the presentation. Our phone number, once again, is listed on the screen. We look forward to hearing from you.